said, what do you want to do next? And I was telling him about this movie, which I didn't, I didn't know where he was at, you know, acting-wise. He said, oh, I want to do it. So he's in it, and he's, he's great. I mean, I have no idea how the world is going to receive it, because you never know that sort of thing. But uh, he's, he's really great in the movie. He's brought a lot of his personal commitment to it. So it's exciting. I have, it's far from finished. You know, I'm here a little bit on vacation because I have, it's been very, I'm really tired because uh, the previous movie was physically very difficult. Um, you know, it was both Europe and the jungle. And this one, I thought would be easier. Not easier meaning like an easy movie to make, but physically easier, and it was not. So, uh, I, need, I needed to come. When? I mean, I have to go home. I have over 600 shots to review, so I'm, I'm getting emails. By the way, where are you? Where are you? Come back. <laughs> White was you not easy. You didn't tell them that he goes tomorrow. I did. Just, I, did. I, told, I told them that I did. I told them that they knew, and so they scheduled around that mm -hmm. because they knew I was coming here. It's, it was important to me. I, I mean, what it is is basically you sit in the theater for 12, 15 hours a day with a little laser pointer. Shot 603 RF. Uh, there's a little bit of magenta in the corner of this image, and I would add a little reflection there. Also, uh, hundreds of shots every day. So I'm tired. But it's a high class problem. It's okay. I'm doing something <laughs> about it. When you think when you finish, what is it? What is the Trajectory. Well, they, they want, or I don't know about that, they want the movie to be done by, you know, release date, May 22nd, they want it done earlier than that. <laughs> and I am really scared about that because, you know, originally they wanted January for a December quad release, and it was, I thought, and I was right, there was no way we were going to make that. I mean, I have been very, very insistent that there, you know, usually when you see a science fiction movie and there are uh, number of shots that don't look very good and I did not want to be up against a release date and have stuff looking bad and I'm hoping we can make May but I'm at least on, on paper it feels like that Astra uh, is like a companion piece to the Lost City of Z I mean like they use the general uh, movies tropes to tell stories about sons who are under the shadow of their parents something like uh -huh. that no? Well, I'll let you comment on that when you see it. <laughs> I mean, uh, of course, I only read the... Um, yeah. You're not wrong, but you'll see it. You'll, I don't know, you'll be able to... You'll have more insight into that than I will. Because, I mean, you're, you're not wrong on the surface. It's almost like one is the flip side of the other. But that was not... No, it, it, it's not that it wasn't intentional, but I don't... It's, it's, I'm not... I mean, I'm, of course, a narcissist, because directors are narcissists, but I'm not that much of a narcissist that I think about it that way. Okay. I was just trying to, to tell as personal a story as I could. Were you speak to rather sci-fi, or the rather drama? It's both. Why put it in the box? This is a number one problem I have. Now, by the way, it's a fair question. I'm not saying that. But it, the, the number one problem I have with the kind of festival situation is there's always this temptation to classify the movie immediately. And if you look at, and I've tried to warn my fellow jurors about this, I said that directors and movie critics are the worst people to judge movies. Mm -hmm. Because directors are always thinking, I could do that, or I don't like that because I can do that, you know. And then critics are always saying, this part of the movie is like the 1947 version, and this part of the movie, it's like, Fuck, just watch the movie and try and absorb it, not compare it to some other fucking movie, you know, put it in a box. So I think the answer is both and maybe neither, I don't know. Um, that's for you to see it and criticize me for or not, I don't know. And that, that's why I want, sorry, I want to ask you, what uh, represents Marrakesh for you, the festival? Because it's a different culture, different backgrounds and... Uh, uh, and being a president of jury uh, of uh, films uh, of new cinema, new... Uh... It's fantastic. It's why I'm, I'm here, because I don't get to see these movies. Mm -hmm. I just don't. I mean, I watch a movie every night. Mm -hmm. I have a great, great home theater, big screen, great sound, and a very comfortable couch. <laughs> and uh, 
sometimes too comfortable. Uh, and I watch a movie every night. But my, I watch what I can get either from Filmstruck, which is now going out of business. I don't know if you know what that is. Mm -hmm. um, or uh, other sources that I have that are not Filmstruck. <laughs> that's what to talk about. But I can't get on top of watching every movie from every country. I was asked at another roundtable earlier about Arabic cinema. I mean, we get nothing mm. of Arabic cinema. Yeah. I am Lebanese, and yeah. I know that you get nothing. Yeah, you get nothing. <laughs> I saw, I'll give you an example, I saw a fantastic, well, I, lo I loved it, a, uh, a movie uh, made by a Palestinian director, Emilia Suleiman, when I was in Cannes yes. in 2010, mm -hmm. 9, I can't remember now, called The Time That Remains. Yeah, and I, I watched that and I was like, wow, that is really, really fantastic. Almost like, not, I mean, I thought it was great. And, and it kind of freaked me out because I realized how little of it we get. Mm -hmm. So I use that example as an excuse to watch... Uh, other movies at festivals because it's the only chance I get. That's the truth. Mm -hmm. Somebody else asked me also about African cinema. I said, past Usmani Senbene, I don't know shit, which is horrible, but it's not my fault. Mm -hmm. I do the best I can. You know who's great about it is Marty Scorsese. He, I don't know how he gets these movies, but he has resources, frankly, beyond mine, and he has a whole foundation, and he gets everything. So sometimes I get stuff you know, from him, but I... But I, I He's on more on top of it than I am. But because even he, but even he has trouble seeing Because he restores films also. Well, yeah, but I'm not talking about old movies. I'm talking about stuff that mm. comes out, yeah. contemporary stuff. Like yesterday, he was talking about Spanish cinema. He mentioned a couple of directors that were new to me. I was asking about. I, I hadn't heard of them, and I was like, oh, I have to check those guys out. Was that good? Yeah. Spanish. Yeah, I can't remember. Roberto Cortez. Cortez. He mentioned. Rodrigo Cortez. Rodrigo Cortez was one. I wrote them down. I, I, um, I've, not, I've not seen any. Um, but, for example, uh, like, here's a Portuguese director, Pedro Costa. I had not seen anything by Pedro Costa until only about three years ago. But he'd been working for such a long time, but I only got to see his movies recently because they became, finally became available, and I wanted to watch them under the right circumstances. You know, I didn't want to... I'd been heard of hearing about him for many years, and he was a major figure, so uh, you want to watch them under the right circumstances. No, no. Uh, speaking of festivals, I know you had a kind of a difficult experience with the immigrants in Cannes. Would you be willing to go, or I mean, what's your feeling towards Cannes? I, 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 I'm not. Well, yes, I am debating your question. I don't really want to talk about my future experience in Cannes. I can talk to you about my past experience in Cannes. But you're open to the idea, or completely already in Cannes? Yeah, but I hope it'll be ready in May. I don't know if it will be. Um, you know, Cannes is very difficult. I think most of the people that go to Cannes and watch movies there are full of shit. I think, I think that they're there for some bullshit agenda. They don't allow the movie to be absorbed emotionally. I've been on a jury, and Isabelle Huppert was fantastic. I told a joke about it in Reykjavik, Iceland, to a journalist, and the next thing I know, it got out that I wasn't getting along with it, which was totally wrong. I mean, mm -hmm. totally mm -hmm. wrong. But I know that the juries are, I think, I really mean that when I said that earlier. I think, I think filmmakers are really bad judges of movies. And I've told that to my jurors here. I said, we have to make sure that we are not trying to project our, what we want from the movie. Like, it didn't do this or that like I want it. It's not about that. Mm -hmm. It's trying okay. to absorb what they are trying to communicate. And I think that, um, you know, I'll, I let time be the judge. I can tell you that, uh, and this is maybe a statement of some arrogance, but uh, in a way, all filmmakers are arrogant. We have to be, because mm -hmm. it's, you know, I think my films have held up pretty well, mm -hmm. and I wouldn't really yeah. say the same of all the winners of the awards. So that mm -hmm. should tell you something. I think the problem is, with that festival in particular, um, and again, I've seen it firsthand from the other side as well, they are the protectors of the status quo. Mm -hmm. And in a way, they don't think they are, right? They think they're being bold. But and I'm not talking about the, ch I'm not talking about the festival, the, you know, the, the flameau. I'm talking about the, the, the critical establishment is mm -hmm. stuck. Mm -hmm. 
stuck in 1968. Mm -hmm. If it's handheld camera, you know the tropes, you can see it from a mile away. Now that doesn't mean every movie with a handheld camera is bad. Mm -hmm. I think the Dardenne's are great. But there is a language that is accepted in Cam. Mm -hmm. That is a fact. Mm -hmm. And when you see a movie which has Darius Kanji's photography and it's a very classical story, you think, uh, or is presented as such, it's different from the other movies. The mm -hmm. Immigrant, I'm sure, I've seen all the movies in competition from that year. And that movie was very different from all the other movies in competition. Even the Coens. The Coens have a very kind of, you know, very uh, elegant style, but mm -hmm. the movies are ironic. Yeah. And so, um, you know, I'm not saying the immigrant is good. It's not for me to say that. It's, it I can, I can, thank you. <laughs> but, 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 but what it was was, it was me trying to do Puccini in a field where they were all trying to still do 1968. Mm -hmm. So, it's a weird thing, and you watch it and you go, what? And. Is there a disdain for classicism? Is that the problem? I think there's a misreading of classicism. I think people mistake form for content. They see that it's a story that they can track, and they mistake it for conservative. I don't think that's what makes a film modern or not. Now, that doesn't mean every movie that has a fractured narrative is not modern. Obviously, there are some, but I think you have to look at the what the film is actually trying to express before you proclaim it conservative or not. That's a, and that is a much trickier thing to do, and um, it's just my taste. You know, I, I, I can't, and I, that is a problem in these festivals, because they want something that is on the surface taking big risks. And to me, you know, once I saw Derek Jarman's movie Blue, I knew at least I think, that there's nothing else you can do formally in cinema. There really isn't. You know, once Jackson Pollock dripped his paint on the canvas, that was it. There, there is the form of cinema, and he kind of broke the mold. Mm -hmm. And I could try to do that over and over, but to me, it would be tired. Do you know what I mean by stuck in 1968? It's like, trying to make a political statement with the movies in a form that seems really tired to me. Can we reinvent cinema? Reinvent. Can a person reinvent cinema? Yes. Can people Re reinvent cinema? Yes. Can it? Yes, but I don't think you can do it trying to reinvent it. I think that if you're trying to reinvent the medium, it's usually a problem because there's a sincerity that needs to be there. And if you're trying to reinvent the medium, it means you're already putting yourself in front of the material. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I, in other words, there is something weirdly personal about 2001. I, I mean, maybe he was thinking, I'm gonna reinvent the medium. He probably was, but I don't think that's, you know, what's the best thing in that movie? The best thing in that movie for me is the HAL 9000 computer being killed. Mm -hmm. And that's, a very narrative idea. The all-knowing computer that's killed, that's the Cyclops from Odysseus, right? Mm -hmm. And you feel sorry for it as it's being killed. Much like you feel sorry for the Cyclops in, in the Odyssey when he, you know, when, when he blinds it. So, that tells me that in Western civilization, the Greeks kind of figured it out and if you have arrogance and you think you can reinvent the wheel, then you probably aren't. So you can only do something as honestly as you can. I mean, I think the conformist is getting in a new cinematic language, and maybe they were trying to do that. You mentioned? It's difficult to in Hollywood to, to make this kind of classical movie. It's almost impossible. I mean, I, I, I've talked about this many times. I have a lot of friends who are directors, but I feel completely alone. I don't have a group of friends who are doing this, trying to do the same thing I am. Now that doesn't mean I'm right, but it, but it is really hard because I don't, you know, I don't, I don't feel that sense of camaraderie. I have maybe one or two other friends who have uh, similar tastes. P.T. Anderson's a friend of mine, and he's trying to do things but like do this. But even he's doing something I don't know. 
do you feel that film as an art form still has the same value as it used to have? Is no. If, you, if I say to you, or maybe as an American, it's easier for me to say this, but if I say to you the line, I'm going to make him an Oscar camera suit. <laughs> you all laugh, you know what movie that is. Mm -hmm. That was made in 1972. Mm -hmm. Can you quote me a line from Avatar? <laughs> <laughs> That's the biggest movie ever made, right? I don't speak. <laughs> but no, but it's the point. You can't do it. You no, cannot. No, 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 I agree. Because the the place of cinema in the culture is different. It's very true. Yeah. And the reason it's different, there's actually there I think the reason is the studios used to make a commitment. There were seven studios or you know, there was Republic, there were RKO, and then gone back and forth. So let's say seven, right? Each one of them made one or two movies that they didn't think were going to make a lot of money, but maybe were awards movies or whatever. That meant you had at the end of the year 10, 12, maybe even 14 movies that maybe weren't successful, maybe weren't good even, but they were at least intense. And then you had the new Hollywood, which was a whole other story. So for the first 60 years of the sound era in Hollywood, you had an investment in maintaining a broad-based interest in the medium. And then, after Star Wars, something happened where the interest, well, I guess it's capitalism, but the interest in making only things that made huge amounts of money started to come into play. And they don't make those one or two movies each, and they probably think that's so smart because they don't have to waste money on them. And now the medium is dying. So. Why is that? Why is it no longer part of the language in... I'm talking about the United States. I can't speak for other places because I live in the United States. I can tell you that in the United States it does not... it does not have the same position of prominence and importance that it used to have. And I think that the reason is the work isn't coming from, from American filmmakers uh, like it used to. Now internationally it is. But that's a whole other story because the delivery system for international cinema is quite different, and also the American cinema is so goddamn dominant. You know. You what mentioned. What do you think of uh, Martin Scorsese making a film for Netflix? Because Martin himself yesterday at this uh, discussion said that he's very unhappy about the companies talking about content instead of yes. films, and in a way he's making content for Netflix. Uh, I don't blame him at all. I mean, filmmakers are hostage to the system, and they gave him the money to do it, and he's making an experiment, and God bless him. I would never blame him. I would do it in a second if they gave me the money to make some personal movie. Can, 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 can I, sorry, can I? Can I ask you, going back to science fiction, because you mentioned 2001, Star Wars, and Avatar, three very different films. What is your relationship with science fiction? I mean, as an audience, what, what defined in your imagination, what science fiction was. For me, it was Star Wars, because I was six years old and I went to see the first movie was Star Wars. What, how was it for you and well, how it developed? Maybe this, maybe this defines it. I don't consider Star Wars science fiction. I consider it fantasy, mm -hmm. you know? And it's sort of, science, Star Wars is sort of like Flash Gordon or Buck Rogers, you know, one of those B-movie or serials that mm -hmm. people watched on Saturday mornings, you know, that's yeah. basically what he did, mm -hmm. combining it with the story ideas of Campbell and Kurosawa, it's a weird, you know, melange, a mixture. Um, it, I know this sounds like bullshit, but I try to think as little as possible about the genre if I'm doing a genre film. I try to think as little as possible about science fiction, I try to think as little as possible about policier. Because I don't want to get uh, stuck in the tropes of the genre, so I, I, I didn't watch 2001 before this. I didn't watch Blade Runner. I love those movies, but I didn't. I don't want to get stuck in what they're doing because then I'm going to repeat it. It's not going to be as good. But it was more on a personal level, not related. No, to I understand answer. your question, but um, I guess what I'm answering you on a personal level would be: I don't think about the genre. I think is the movie being honest with me. I really don't. I really don't think about genre. I. I mean, it's funny because Michel Franco, who I love, who is on, is on the jury. He mm -hmm. said, he said, what's the hardest genre? I think it's biography. So I said, oh, I, know, I never thought of that. I never thought of you know. It's really hard. I said, oh, Raging Bull's great. He said, yeah, but it's Jake LaMotta is not a great figure. 
He said, what is like a great figure, great movie? So I said, I don't know, Lawrence Arabia? Yeah, but it's not really telling his story. <laughs> I said, well, come on. So I realized I don't think about genre. Maybe that's a mistake. Maybe I'm wrong. The audience does. They do and critics do. Uh, so maybe I should, but I don't. Do you think about Last Shots? I mean, I know that The Immigrant and Last City of Z book build towards almost yeah. thesis statements in their last shots. Thesis statement? Oh, God. Well, no, it's the wrong word, but just an evocative image that completely sends the audience away. It depends on the context, and uh, I did, in those cases, I thought of the shots. I mean, how, you have to, they're very complicated, both of them. Right, but, but I mean, they're, they're, they're larger than just a last shot. They're, they're, they're symphonic, almost, in the image itself. That's a good thing. You don't want the shot to stand out like that. That's bad. That's calling attention to itself. Uh, it's what the audience is left with. You know, maybe it's a reaction because I had the ending of one of my films fucked with early on. Oh, yeah. And uh, that, yes, the arts. And, the, and actually, the critics at, uh, in Cannes that year were correct. But I couldn't do anything about that because the ending was changed. And uh, maybe it's an unconscious knowledge that I have to fucking get the ending as memorable as I possibly can. By the way, he wanted to change the ending of The Immigrants, and he fought me like crazy. And I can talk about Harvey, it's so great. Like, this huge weight is lifted. Because <laughs> now everybody knows what I was talking about for 20 years. Uh, but, but in that case, you know, Harvey said, I'm not going to release your movie. It's terrible. It sucks. You do it so much. Oh, thank you. I think. <laughs> Uh, and he, I said, why was he said the ending should be like narration where he, she's walking over a mountain with her sister and your voiceover saying, my sister, I made her in California to be great. <laughs> I said, Harvey, that's the ending to The Sound of Music. <laughs> he said, well, you're fucking shot. <laughs> so so we have to do... I've actually really enjoyed this. You're getting going to get me in trouble about Cam. No. Because I spoke too honestly about the critical reaction of that movie, which really upset me. But because now the critics is different, like the screenings. Yeah, no, they, well, they, they get booed, you know, they get booed. And to me, it's like, okay, you don't have to like the movie, but don't boo it. But now they can boo it. There is no morning screenings anymore for press. Yes, right, you've yes. seen that. Yes. No, I didn't know that. Yeah, yes. Primo scrapped the morning screenings for critics because he because wanted, of the, yeah. he, because he wanted to there. avoid the booze and stuff. Yes. We see the movie after the, 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 yes. the, the premiere. Come on, you know that. Let's make yes. headlines. The critics are the taking Maybe not this year. <laughs> yes. So that changes everything, right? Not really. But the one thing you were saying I think it goes even further than that uh, New Hollywood. I mean, I remember a film like Fatal Attraction, as constantly terrible, whatever it may be, it's an Adrian Lyne film, no. and it's uh, manipulative. I mean, people were talking about it yes, for course, days absolutely. on end, and that has gone. It's gone. Even from, some, even from mainstream cinema. I know, but here's, you know what? They wouldn't make Fatal Attraction today. There's mm -hmm. no IP attached to it. They're doing it as a series. <laughs> Right, that's exactly right. So, there's your example. They wouldn't make it. Right. They wouldn't make Fatal Attraction. Yeah. By the way, the original idea of Fatal Attraction, you know what happened with that yeah. movie? That's a pretty interesting idea. Whereas he, that's an interesting story idea. It's very Anna Karenina, right? Mm. That she gets pregnant. Yes. I just compared that to Anna Karenina. <laughs> 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 you can't get some lunch.